Hi, I'm Nature Nate, and welcome to the first episode of Waste Not, Why Not? This is a podcast where we're going to talk about how not to save the environment in an inefficient and ineffective way. I'm an environmental researcher based in Taiwan, working on energy, ocean, and waste issues. We all want to do what's good for the environment, but we don't always know how. There's a lot of misleading information, oversimplified solutions, and overhyped innovations that are steering us the wrong way. In every episode, we're going to look at the ways we're trying to save the environment and what we should be doing instead. For example, are paper straws actually good? Can I recycle a light bulb? Do beach cleanups work? Are corals going to die? Can we just suck up all the plastic waste? A lot of popular solutions that you might see on social media or hear about from your friends actually create more environmental problems and even more waste. We are wasting an opportunity for effective change. The reason I wanted to do this is that I've worked on environmental projects across government, NGOs, and business, and many of them fail massively. Instead of starting another project, I wanted to educate as many people as possible on how to make effective change, as we are really running out of time. For this first episode, we wanted to give you a little sampling, a list, if you will, of some of the things that we're going to be talking about on the show. In the future, we're going to dig into one topic at a time. So let's get started. I'm Nature Nate. This is Waste Not, Why Not, a podcast where we talk about how not to waste your time in saving the environment. Item number one on today's list of overhyped, eco-friendly, green machines. These are the things that you find on Facebook, on Twitter, on Kickstarter. The stuff that promises you the moon and gives you a pile of garbage. This first one is C-Bin. Picture this. You're in bed. Perhaps it's early in the morning or maybe late at night. You pop open Facebook or Twitter and start to scroll. Babies, Trump, cats, and then suddenly you see it. It's a device that sucks up ocean trash. <laughs> you quickly share the post and write proudly. Why can't every city have this? Well, dear well-intentioned social media user, I have bad news. This technology won't actually solve the problem. This magical device is called the sea bin, or what I like to call the suck bucket. It was invented by two well-intentioned surfer dudes who thought that because we have trash bins on land, we should also have them in the sea. The ocean bin that they invented sits in the water and sucks up plastic and trash without harming sea life. You might have seen this in a viral Facebook post in 2016, but I'm still seeing it everywhere almost three years later. The video opens with this happy campy music. We see all sorts of trash and goo being sucked up inside of this bright yellow bucket in the marina. The sea bin was supposed to be a new hope in the fight against ocean plastic pollution. Good intention! Yes! And in the video, sea bin looks simple. It seems like you could just buy this and use it to pick up a bunch of trash. On principle, I'm supportive of this idea because it's good to remove trash near the shore. And boat marinas are a large contributor. But my problem is this. Does this dinky bucket match the scale of plastic pollution? No, the buckets are not nearly large enough to make a difference. This works in your pool because it basically is a pool cleaner, but it doesn't work in the ocean. And even at the marina, you have to move it around. This project gets a lot of attention, but it's wasted because we haven't actually seen any real change in that video since 2016. What we should really pay attention to or should I say who, is Mr. Trash Wheel. Mr. Trash Wheel lives in Baltimore and loves Twitter, punk rock, and sucking up trash from the marina. He's about the size of a boat and has a giant water wheel with two big booms and two big googly eyes. And he's so cute that you can watch him suck up trash all day on a 24 seven live stream and even visit him as a tourist attraction. Mr. Trash Wheel was invented in 2008 by John Kellett, who told NPR that it looks like a cross between a spaceship, a covered wagon, and an old mill. Now, Mr. Trash Wheel cleans up about 250 tons of trash each year. 
To put that into context, that's about the same weight as 20 passenger jets. That's not an insignificant amount of trash. Since then, the trash wheel family has expanded to include the female professor trash wheel and the gender neutral captain trash wheel. The three of them together have cleaned up more than 1,000 tons since 2014. That's a lot of jumbo jets. Now that doesn't sound like a huge dent, but when we do the math, we find out that we only need 32,000 Mr. Trash Wheels uh, in every major river to completely stop land-based plastic pollution. When you think about the amount of rivers in India or China or the US, that might sound kind of ridiculous, but imagine how many sea bins we would need. We would probably need a billion sea bins. So in that context, Mr. Trash Wheel matches the scale of plastic pollution where sea bin sadly does not. Okay, and before we move on, if you have Twitter, follow Mr. Trash Wheel. They have a great feed and share all their data. And if you're from Mr. Trash Wheel, hit us up. I'd like to talk trash with you. Number two in overhyped, eco-friendly green machines that don't actually solve problems, the Sandmaker. This comes from a New Zealand beer company, and it's a vending machine that crushes beer bottles into sand. This invention was supposed to address the global loss of sand. Yes, that's right, our beaches are shrinking from sand mining. Companies are harvesting this natural sand and using it to create artificial islands, hotels, and even new beaches. For example, one dredging machine from Semex, a Mexican construction company, dredges up to 2,000 Olympic-sized swimming pools of sand per year. This is just one machine. Imagine in your mind one Olympic sized swimming pool, fill it with sand, and then multiply that by 2,000. That's a lot of grains. So, this beer company, together with an advertising agency, thought that if beer bottles could be crushed back into sand, then they could save the beaches in New Zealand. So, they created these vending machines that could be placed throughout the country. This has all the components of a feel good campaign. Beer, check. Beach, check. Saving the world, check. Social responsibility, check. Now let's buy their beer. No, stop. This is actually bullshit. How do I know this is bullshit? Well, if you go to their website, the only information they have about their sand machine is a single image infographic. And that's just not enough information to convince me. Second, this might actually hurt the environment more. Now, for this to work, the sand that gets produced from the crushed bottles needs to be collected, often throughout the islands of New Zealand. And sand is really heavy. It takes a lot of fuel to move it around. You need large trucks. Those trucks create a lot of noise. And because those trucks are heavy from all that sand, they're going to be damaging the roads. This is a really potentially serious environmental problem. Third, bottles shouldn't be crushed for sand. They should be recycled into glass. They are infinitely recyclable. Glass bottles were one of the first products we ever actually recycled, and that's because it's easy to do. We're good at it. Here in Taiwan, we recycle more than 95% of our glass bottles. In Europe, bottles are typically reused multiple times before recycling. And in the US, the first recycling legislation was about glass bottles. To sum up, we are good at recycling glass. The wasted opportunity for this campaign is that their technology could actually solve a problem with unrecyclable glass, but instead it was marketed as a solution to sand mining. But that's not really what it does. It's just a marketing gimmick, not a real environmental solution. So this campaign is successful in only one way, and that's getting you more drunk. And the more beers you drink, the more that this campaign makes sense. It's not going to solve the sand mining problem, but it could solve a boring Friday night. So this invention adds nothing, won't work, and is basically just marketing. I vote it as a waste. Okay, number three in overhyped, eco-friendly, green things that don't solve problems. Biodegradable six-pack rings. For this invention, Saltwater Brewery in Florida has created not only biodegradable, but supposedly edible six-pack carrier rings. A promotional video shows off a computer-generated sea turtle eating computer-generated six-pack rings. Wow! This product is made using 
leftovers from the beer production process. And normally I'm a huge fan of products from waste, but the framing here is problematic. Six pack rings and people's obsession with them blows my mind. After we're done using them, we cut them up because we assume that we're gonna put them in the ocean and sea life are gonna swim through them. Why do we do this? We don't do this with any other piece of trash. Condoms, that goes in the bin. Light bulbs, that goes in the bin. But every other type of trash is just as dangerous. But for some reason, for six pack rings, we've learned to cut them up. But we gotta cut up those rings. Now it's cool to litter, bro. In general, we probably shouldn't be designing products to be littered. Why else would we have a trash collection system? And these edible, biodegradable six-pack rings, you know, just because something is edible doesn't mean that it's good for you. You can eat plastic, it just someday will kill you. If they had tested these six-pack rings to make sure that they were healthy for animals, then I wouldn't have a problem with this. But so far, this is just a marketing gimmick where they insinuate that it's okay for animals to eat this just because it's seemingly natural. Why stop at six-pack rings? The production of the beer itself is actually a strain on the environment in terms of energy, water, and materials. We don't always responsibly harvest hops. The aluminum in the cans is terrible for the environment, unless it's recycled. And if we're dedicated to environmental causes, shouldn't we go all the way for truly sustainable production and packaging? But Nate, this product is a start. It's really green. It's circular even. They use their own waste to make packaging and degrades. That's great, but only if it's the start of something greater. Otherwise, this is just a feel-good marketing push. Biodegradable rings? Meh. Why not create products that are thoroughly sustainable? Or better yet, drink beer in taps or in kegs. Buy in bulk. Just drink responsibly. Finally, our last item in overhyped, eco-friendly, green products that don't actually solve the problems. It's an edible water bubble. Oh ho. No, really, I'm fine. That's what it's called. Oh ho. People on the streets, smiling and sucking on transparent little balls. That was my Facebook feed for a couple months. The ooh -hoo, edible water bubble is a natural replacement for water bottles that uses an edible material to store water. But uh, how useful is this? Okay, the concept here is that plastic water bottles are bad for the environment. And yes, plastic water bottles are very wasteful, but they're not actually that bad. When you think about places without access to clean water, I, I can empathize. It's easy to understand why we still need water bottles so people can have clean water. Everybody uses polyethylene, PET, because it's lightweight, cheap, safe, and stable. The parts to highlight here are stable. You can bottle liquid somewhere and then ship it thousands of miles across different temperatures and humidities and make sure that it reaches the place it needs to go safely. Can we do this with uhu water bubbles? Probably not, especially because their website says that they degrade in four to six weeks. Okay, so the bubbles don't last, but it still looks cool, right? I can just pop one in and eat some water, right? Well, if this works, where the f is it? I will tell you where, nowhere. And why is that? Because it doesn't actually work. Plus, to actually get an uhu, you have to have an uhu making machine. This isn't something you buy in a store. You buy the machine and then you make the water bubbles. Now, large beverage manufacturers are not gonna be able to use this technology to replace water bottles. That means the only place that they're going to be using it is in small stores, which makes this completely unscalable and not really a replacement for water bottles. I will say that this is a good first step and we definitely wanna see this kind of innovation. This is better than some other types of supposedly biodegradable plastic, for sure. But so far, it's not just ready. This is market testing, sorry. So instead of getting all hyped about this future material that doesn't work, why not just use a cup or a water cooler or a water filter? We already have the solutions to stop plastic bottles. So that caps off our top four green false hopes of 2018. First, we had the sea bin, which failed to suck as hard as it should. Then we had the sand maker, which just made a big mess. Then we had the biodegradable rings, which were probably not safe to eat. And then we had the uhu water bubble, which we'll never actually end up using. All of these environmental solutions had good intentions, but most of those intention was just to make money. 
The problem with these inventions comes down to context or narrative. The invention is either a good idea in isolation, or comes from a false story about how the environment or economics actually works. I don't blame people for trying. We should always innovate and grow. That's the point of science and business, and I could easily be wrong. But the point is also to criticize shit that doesn't work. People are not rational consumers. They are easy to lie to. Just look at religion or multi-level marketing. Environmental products are no different. We're terrified of many things. The environment is just another thing on that list. Like a lucky rabbit's foot or a coin in a well, we think we can acquire little trinkets to ward off the evil spirits of pollution and ocean acidification. But we can't. Well, we won't most of the time. All of those solutions that we need are collective, community-based, and systematic. That doesn't mean that individual changes aren't needed. They are, but they seldom arise out of purchasing a new gizmo. Rather, it's not buying the gizmo. It's making something yourself or helping a true craftsman. There is no website to avoid bullshit greenwashed products and services yet. That's what this podcast aims to be. It's your light in the green darkness. It's your compass in a maze of misfiring good intentions. We hope you've enjoyed this first episode of Waste Not, Why Not. In the next episodes, we will look at beach cleanups, corals, paper straws, maybe even a blockchain or two. I'm Nature Nate, and this is the Waste Not, Why Not podcast, recorded on a cloudy day in Taipei, Taiwan, using a Yeti provided by Blue Microphones. Subscribe to our show, look us up on social media, and if you like our show, tell a friend about it. If you have feedback or questions, send us an email. You can find all our contact information in the show notes. This has been a Ghost Island Media production. This episode was produced by Emily Y. Wu, written by me, Nature Nate, edited and sound engineered by Emily Cardinelli, original theme song by Chris Lowe, show logo by Kathy Hsu, Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.